All right, class, here we are once again. I'm going to uh, apologize for the informality of our surrounding area here. Um, I'm in the process of moving, which most of you uh, have come into contact with at some point in your life, and you realize it's an absolute disaster when you're trying to accomplish anything other than that task at hand moving. But real life calls that we continue to do other things as well, so here we are, discussion of ethics. Now, if you recall, we have just jumped off of another ethical theory that is trying to, again, ground um, objective, that is to say, prescriptive uh, ethical behaviors, ethical acts, ethical norms, uh, the way you should be, right? The alt. It's not just, it wasn't merely descriptive. Uh, it didn't just say, hey, this is how uh, people particularly act. This is how they, uh, how we find people uh, behaving. No, rather it was, again, it was supposed to be a way that we ought to act. Remember, it was supposed to be a way that we ought to behave. Now, this is where we go, we're going to come into contact with another ethical theory, again, that wants to give us objective, uh, absolute. Again, we're, even though those are, those are technically if some different meanings there, we're going to use those synonymously here for our purpose again, of absolute and objective. Because the point we're just trying to convey at this, at this juncture is just that they're real. They're not just arbitrary, made up, uh, something of that nature. Um, and so what we want to do is, just as we noted that the last ethical th uh, uh, theory, DCT, or Divine Command Theory, uh, has its roots in theism. This particular ethical theory is also embraced by many theists. Now, the contrast is this ethical theory doesn't necessarily have its roots only in uh, a strict sort of theism or theistic belief or any sort of particular religion. Um, well, then why is this all also embraced by uh, many theists if it's not, uh, strictly speaking, uh, exclusive to uh, theists or some particular religion? Interesting question. I'm glad you asked it through me, and we will address that a bit later. So what is this particular ethical theory? Today, we're going to discuss natural law theory. Now, Let's go ahead and look at some of this preliminary stuff here. Natural law theory is a teleological ethical theory that is based upon a prior metaphysical commitment regarding the nature or essence of the human being or the nature of the essence of the thing in question. Now, remember the difference between an, a teleological and a deontological uh, theory. Remember, deontological was about the thing before you immediately the principle before you. Um, it didn't have anything to do with the consequences, right? It didn't have anything to do with uh, the on down the road considerations when it comes to determining what's right or wrong. Now, strictly speaking, this particular ethical theory is teleological, but it's not teleological in the same sort of, in the same sense that consequentialism, uh, you know, or utilitarianism was teleological. Remember, because uh, consequentialism or and, 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 and slash or utilitarianism, hence the name, was strictly concerned with the utility or the consequence of what happens down the road. So what does this mean to say that this ethical theory is teleological? Well, this ethical theory, as we'll, as we'll unpack, uh, is, is saying that when it's teleological in the sense that it's saying that there's a way things are, right? And if you are one of those things, well, then there's a way you ought to be in relation to the standard of that thing itself. What on earth do you mean? All right, good. We'll, we'll unpack that. But I just want you to know that there, it's teleological, but it's in a slightly different sense um, than just merely 
uh, some sort of consequential consideration. Now, our next slide here, I wanna, I wanna address this, but our next slide uh, will go into this. Natural law theory or classical, the classical theory of natural law theory, there's actually a new uh, version, neoclassical law, something like that. Uh, but we're not going to worry about that right now. This is the classical version. And it rests upon an explanation of four causes, which entail the existence of natures and essences. Now, this is what we want to we make sure that we clear up at the onset. A lot of people think that when we're talking about natural law, they, 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 they seriously confuse that with, with the idea of nature itself, meaning like the jungle, right? The law of the jungle, something like that, or whatever happens in nature uh, is just what's right or wrong. Now, obviously, there's all sorts of difficulties with that. There's all sorts of problems that would result from uh, merely enacting whatever we see happening in nature, right? I mean, uh, dogs eating their young, you know, if they're or killing their young if they're runts or if they're too small or, or for whatever reason. Other, other easy examples that we could choose. No, natural law is not talking about just whatever happens in nature is right or wrong. The word here, if you look at the slide, the word nature, look right here uh, where it says natural law theory classical rests upon an explanation of four causes which entail the existence of nature's so when we're talking about nature's in this sense, we're talking about the nature of a thing, the essence of a thing, right? So if someone were to say, why on earth is, is, is a dog, you know, doing, you know, fill in the blank, whatever it's doing. And someone were to say, well, that's just the nature of what it means to be a dog to do those sorts of things. He's, be, he's just being a dog, right? That's what dogs do, right? Or if you were to th think of something that's what we would call a human artifact, think of a knife. If someone said, uh, what does a knife do? You know, what is, what is a knife? And then you describe it as, oh, well, a knife is just the sort of thing that can uh, separate one piece of matter from another in, in, by virtue of, of slicing it so thinly that it separates the matter. It just cuts, right? That's just what a knife does. So in other words, it's just the nature of a knife. That's just the essence of a knife. Now, again, that's slightly different than biological systems and things that aren't just made simply by humans. But it's analogous in the sense that you can get the point that, that what we mean when we're saying that that's the nature of something. That's the essence of something. What the thing is in question and what does it do? And, and here's the key. Listen to this. And is it doing what it's supposed to do based off the sort of thing that it, here's the key, is. Is it doing what it's supposed to do or is it being what it's supposed to be in light of what it is? Now that sounds complicated, but it's really, again, it's really not. The reason you can recognize a good knife from a bad knife is how? Think about that. You walk into the kitchen, knife is dull, it doesn't cut, and you're like, man, this is a crappy knife. This is a terrible knife. This is a bad knife. Why? Well, because the, the knife is just not doing what the knife was made or designed or is was created to do, right? It's not fulfilling its nature. It's not uh, instantiating um, to the fullest its essence or its nature there. Now, is that possible in regard to other things? So, having said that, what we want to look at is, is, is causes here. Because natural law theory rests pretty heavily on uh, an explanation and, and, and something of an understanding of, uh, of a metaphysical system between act and potency. And it was, uh, you know, Aristotle really, really tweaked this, really work this and then Thomas Aquinas uh, comes along later and somewhat pejoratively people say Thomas Aquinas baptizes the philosophy the metaphysics of Aristotle but he doesn't he doesn't just baptize or or uh, completely adopt uh, the metaphysics of Aristotle the philosophy of Aristotle he 
he, he has all sorts of his own cont contributions that he, he puts in. He clarifies things. He tweaks things. He uh, disagrees with some things, all sorts of all sorts of things like that, all sorts of things like that. But one of the things that he does keep, Aquinas, that is, Thomas Aquinas, and one of the things that does really uh, find its, its uh, robust origin, maybe not its strictly speaking origin, but its robust origin, it finds this in Aristotle and his uh, belief in the, the idea that everything that we see has four causes, right? So when you think about this, this is the sort of thing that does make a lot of sense, a lot of common, what we would call common sense. Now, in our day and age, we've been somewhat indoctrinated to believe that everything that exists when we look at things have two causes, two. Now, this is going to be, again, in contrast to Aristotle, right, in his view. He's going to say, no, 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 you guys are, your, your explanation your explanatory scope, explanatory uh, abilities are inadequate because you're only ascribing two causes to things when there are at least four causes to each thing. Well, what does he mean by that? Right? So again, to use something of a, an analogous kind of uh, uh, example is something that, say, just you know, humans make, humans create. Let's say that you see a street sign, right? And your child says, hey, Dad, what is the cause of that? Well, we've been taught in our modern culture, we've been taught that there's basically only two causes to the thing, right? And you've probably already guessed them. The, the matter, whatever it's made of, right, the steel, the specific metal, uh, maybe even the plastic, whatever the stuff is that it's made of, and what would be called the efficient cause. So you've got the material cause, the matter, whatever it's made out of, and the efficient cause. The efficient cause would just be the machine or the person uh, that made the thing, right? That's the cause of the sign. You might say to your son, look, dad, what caused that? Oh, well, the, that, the matter it's made of, the metal, or whatever, that caused it, and the person that made it, that caused it. Aristotle would come along and he'd say, hey, 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 you are seriously uh, lacking, again, in your explan uh, explanatory scope there. You're, you're not, you, you've only touched at least half of the cause. Well, what do we mean by that? Again, let's look at these right here. Look on your slide that we have up. Four causes. Aristotle says there's four causes to everything. The efficient cause, we've already talked about that, the person, the machine, whatever, that made the sign, right? The material cause, that is the matter, the stuff that it's made of. Ah, but what about these last two, the formal and the final cause? Aristotle would say, and Aquinas following him, would say, there's, there's a formal cause to the sign. Yes, fine, yes, absolutely. There is a material and efficient cause, but there's also a formal cause. And the formal cause is, and this is where we get into the nature and the essence of things, because the nature and the essence of a thing is tied up with its formal cause. The formal cause in the case of the sign here would be the, the blueprint or the idea of the sign, right? Meaning that if you have the dude, the efficient cause, the guy, and you have the stuff, well, there has to be something, some idea, some blueprint by which the sign is in made to. Meaning you have to explain why the, why the stuff is arranged in that particular order, say in this instance a sign, and not just arranged in the uh, structure of say a book or a bookshelf or a chair or whatever. No, there's, a, there's some idea, there's some blueprint Otherwise, you have no explanation as to why it's that and not something else, why the material is just not something else, right? Um, because, again, metal doesn't have to be made in the form of a sign, neither does plastic or whatever the sign's made out of. Let's say that you, it's, let's say that it's 400, 500 years ago and the sign's made of wood. Well, the wood doesn't have to be in the form of a sign. It could be in the form of, a, you know, a tree, obviously, or it could be in the form of a wagon wheel or a, a cart or, uh, you know, the side of a house, whatever. It, there has to be some explanation as to why it's in that form as opposed to this form over here. Aristotle calls this the formal cause. 
And when you talk about the formal cause, you're talking about the nature of the essence of the thing, right? You're giving what we would call a, a dictionary type definition of it. Now, so the formal cause is the idea, the blueprint, something like that. So the final cause, what is that? The final cause of, again, let's go back to the sign, is let's say your son's riding down the road and your son says, Dad, what is the cause of that? Why, why is that sign there? And let's say that you say, oh, well, because some dude made the sign. And he's like, no, 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 I'm not talking about that, which would be the efficient cause, right? It's not wrong, but it's not what he's asking. Then he says, oh, well, because the material, the, the, the metal and the, and the steel, and, it, you know, that's what it's made of. And he's like, no, 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 I'm not asking that, Dad. Why is that sign there? And he says, oh, well, because... We have to have some explanation as to why it's the, the metal is in that form and not another form and why it's and he's like yeah 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 i get but that's no i'm asking why the sign is there and so finally it clicks with you and you say oh well the sign's there to tell people what to do right in this this particular situation say go 55 miles an hour or whatever. that is the final cause the final cause is the all right listen here this is key the final cause is the why behind all of the other causes. So Aristotle would say that the final cause, even though it's labeled final, that doesn't have that doesn't mean it's the last cause. Final means it's what the sign is for. It's final goal, right? It's goal, the purpose of. The very purpose of the sign is for telling people what to do, right? Meaning there's a reason for the thing. There's a point to the thing. There's a purpose to the thing. So those are the causes. In fact, Aristotle would say it this way, and Aquinas would agree, that the final cause, the purpose, the end goal of the sign, if you didn't have that, you wouldn't have any of the other, any of the other explanations. None of the other causes would exist. Why? Think about that. If you need to, pause it and think about that. Aristotle and Aquinas would say that the final cause is the cause of causes. <laughs> they would say the final cause is the cause of causes. All the, 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 you're right. Someone's, let's say somebody's riding down this road, and they're like, man, people are driving too fast. You know, there needs to be something here to keep people in order. You know, something here to, so that people can see this, and they'll realize they need to slow down, blah, blah, blah. Aha, I'll make a sign. Right. So you see the point, the final purpose, the goal was already in play. That started the guy who got the stuff, who got the idea, <clears throat> the, the, the structure, the content to make the thing to begin with. That was the whole point of the thing. That was the whole point of the sign. Right. Now, again, you could look at this in terms of the knife. Again, the efficient cause of the knife would be what the dude or whoever makes it, the machine, whatever makes the knife. The material cause is whatever the knife is made out of, right? And the formal cause, again, why the, 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 the steel or whatever it's made out of, you have to have some explanation as to why it's not made into a sign, right? And why, and as opposed to a knife, well, the, the idea, the whatness, the what is itness, right? In philosophy, we use these kind of crazy terms. The essence of, the nature of, the whatness of, uh, Aquinas called the quiddity, the what isness of the knife is explained by the blueprint or the idea of the knife, right? And again, that's otherwise you have no explanation of why it's that that particular matter is in the form of that as opposed to the form of your sign over here. Now, what is the final cause of the knife? What's the purpose of the knife? To cut things, right? So again, the man standing around the kitchen, he sees a loaf of bread or he sees a, a steak or whatever. And let's say this is before knives are around. And he says, how can I separate this piece from that piece so I can save some for later without making a huge mess or whatever he wants to use the knife for, right? You can come up with your own uh, scenario there. So he says, oh, if I had something that could cut this to divide this in half, whatever, the, whatever he wants to do, then he goes about doing all of the other causes, right? Because he had, he want, there's some purpose, there's some end goal, there's some reason for the knife to even exist. There's some reason for the thing to exist, right?
Now again, which religion is making this up? None, right? Again, this is what we would call in just historical terms, theological terms, a pagan, right? Aristotle's system, uh, his metaphysical system, of uh, the four causes, right? This is part of, a, obviously, a larger uh, philosophy and metaphysical system, but this is a key component in that, um, that natural law theory is based off of. So how do we start to tie all this together um, with how this makes, uh, how this makes sense with the nature or essence of something, with these laws or these causes, excuse me. Well, when you see something, right? Let me just flip through these slides here. I want to make sure that I keep this in the right order. All right. All right, yeah, we're going the right way. We're going the right way. All right, so when we see something, right, when you see a chair, again, we're just using human artifacts at this point, just analogous, analog, analogously easy for me to say, uh, to keep the, the idea fresh to see what we're trying to get across here. But when we see a chair, right now I'm looking at a chair over here. When we see a chair, do you know what it's for? Yes or no, do you know what the chair is for? Do you, when you see a chair, do you know what the thing is for? Right, you know what it's for. And how do you know what it's for? How do you know what a chair is made for? In fact, that's even funny to say, how do you know what a chair is made for? Because that presupposes, that assumes you already know, right? Now, what does, what does the chair exist to do, right? Now, when you, you realize that, you are, I don't even have to tell you. I'm not even going to bother telling you. I'm not going to insult your intelligence. I know you know what a chair is for. Now, you know that, right? Which calls would that be? Out of your list of four causes there, which calls are you thinking about? You're thinking about, when I say, what is the chair for? You're going to answer with the purpose of the thing, right? The whole point, the reason it exists, to sit in, right? Uh, to hold somebody up so they can do whatever, right? You, you're, when you answer that question, what is the purpose of the chair? Why is it there? You're going to give me, and Aristotle always sees right here, you're going to answer with the final cause of the thing, the purpose of the thing, the telos. This is why this system is teleological. Because teleological means, remember, telos means goal or purpose, right? You're going to give me the purpose or the end goal of the thing in question, right? Now, can you do that with a knife? Yep. And remember, when I say, what is this knife for? You can go, you can go all the way through that, whatever. Now, what if, what if I were to say, this chair is a really crappy chair, right? This is a bad chair. Or, this is a bad knife, this is a crappy, this is a bad knife. What am I doing there? And how do you know what I'm talking about? You know you can agree or disagree with me based on the formal cause of a knife or the formal cause of a chair. Because you know the end goal of the thing, right? You know what the purpose of the knife is for and you know what the purpose of a chair is for. And if you say that this, it's a bad knife or a bad chair or a bad car or a bad air conditioner, then what you're saying is that it's not in accord with its formal cause, meaning that it's, it may be the thing in question. It may very well be a knife, right? It may very well be a chair. It may very well be an air conditioner. It may very well be a dog, right? But it's not in accord with the the nature of what the thing is in itself, meaning that it, it, even though it is that, it do, it's not up to snuff, so to speak. It's, it's less than its full nature, meaning if the nature and the point, if the point of the final cause of a knife is to cut, is to separate, is to do some purpose, and now that the knife has become dull, it can't fulfill that purpose, well, then it's lost something of what it really even means to be a knife. It's not living up to its nature. It's not living up to the point of why it exists, right? It's not being what it's supposed to be, right? Now, think of this in terms of squirrels, right? If you see a squirrel and you say that's a bad squirrel and you're not talking about the fact that he destroys your attic or whatever, let's say that you're just watching a squirrel out in the woods and he consistently falls out of trees, right? He can't eat acorns without it falling out of his mouth and so eventually he dies or whatever. 
you would say, well, man, that just really was, you know, there wasn't a, what we would call good squirrel, right? There was something less than about that squirrel. Though we recognized it was a squirrel, it was still an instantiation, it had the nature or essence of a squirrel, there was something about it that couldn't fulfill its nature. It wasn't fulfilling its essence or it was going against its nature or its, its essence um, and that it couldn't fulfill its purpose, which, ob which just resulted in death, right? Or uh, resulted in harm to the squirrel, which shouldn't be a surprise because that's not the goal or purpose of squirrels, right? To, cons to drop acorns out of their mouth whenever they try to eat or to fall out of trees when they try to go from limb to limb. Think about it this way. Let's say that you take a hairdryer and you try to drive nails with your hairdryer, right? And you get the thing and you start to beat a couple nails against the wall. Now, would it work? It might work temporarily, you know, depending on what kind of, you know, what the thing's made out of. But what ends up happening is the hairdryer ends up being destroyed. Why? Because that wasn't the purpose of that wasn't the point of, that wasn't the final cause, that wasn't the reason it existed, right? The, the, the hairdryer didn't exist to uh, drive nails. The final cause of, of a hairdryer is not to uh, push nails through hard objects, right? And so, because it went against, because you use that against what the thing's nature was, its nature is its essence there, and again, this is just a human construct, so we can we're just speaking analogously here, but because you were using the hairdryer in a way that contrasted or contradicts its nature, you destroyed the hairdryer. Does that make sense? Think about that. Could you do that with a knife? Would you, could you do something with a knife that's against its nature, that goes against its nature? Yeah, you could. You could use a knife in a way, say, try to use a knife like a screwdriver, right, which we've all probably done at some point. You end up dulling the tip or breaking the tip off or ruining the knife because that's not the nature of a knife. That's not the end goal. That's not the purpose of what the thing was made for, right? That and what causes that? Again, that we're talking about its formal cause, its nature or its essence there. Now, could a dog be used or could it do something that's against its nature or its essence? Of course it could, right? Which would result in harm to the dog or death to the dog or, or some sort of uh, less than uh, objective to the dog, right? Now, could this be the case in regard to most things? And now here's where it gets tricky. Could this be the case in regard to you and me? right? Could this be the case in regard to societies, how societies function? Is there a nature or an essence to what a society is and how it's supposed to function? Um, is there a nature and an essence to sexuality, um, the organs involved in the sexual union? Is there a nature or essence to the thing that there's an end goal or a purpose to why whatever you're talking about is there? Can that be uh, perverted or stultified to make in the sense that it's being made to do something that was not its purpose or its end goal and then what will be the result given enough time would it destroy that particular thing in question right would it uh, break down that particular thing in question would it harm that particular thing in question i think the answer is it just has to be an obvious yes. It does seem like there can be things, right, that are stultified, that are retarded, bent back upon themselves, and that they're being used against the way they were made to be used, right? Um, and in comparison, parallel with that, there are things that aren't living up to the nature, the essence of what they are, right? So let's think of it this way. Why would being... Uh, completely against education or completely just uh, anti-intellectualism, some sort of, you know, I, you know, some ideal, uh, ideology takes off that's just rampant against anti-intellectualism, not using your brain, not being rational. Um, well, Aristotle defined the human beings as rational animals, meaning that we are of the animalian 
type, meaning that we're some sort of biological organism and we run around and do whatever else. But there's also something about us that makes us rational, right? So if that's true, and let's just say for sake of argument that that's true, that we are rational animals. Again, let's just say for sake of argument that we're rational animals. He's given you what? Which cause out of those four causes? He's given you the formal cause, right? Because he's describing your, the nature or essence of what it means to be a human. The nature of essence or of what it means to be a human is just to be that you are a rational animal. Now, if you completely refuse to be rational, right? You just ran around in circles all day long, fell down, tried to eat with your ear, whatever the case may be. Are you a human? Yeah, you're a human, right? But you're stultifying, stultifying or perverting or self-retarding your nature, meaning you're going against what it means to be a human. And the surprise is, or what shouldn't be a surprise rather, is that you will, will that result in your flourishing or will that result in harming yourself and or possibly others? If you try to eat with your ear and you run around in circles and fall down all day. Well, it shouldn't be a surprise that that probably will not, probably, that that won't contribute uh, to your flourishing and you'll end up either dead or, or seriously harmed uh, and most likely both one before the other, right? Well, why? Because you're going against the nature of what it means to be a human being. Does that make sense? Now, let's look at some of the appeals of this, and, and maybe we can go into some more examples. This seems to provide something of a common sense notion of rights and wrongs. Well, how does this, how does it, how does this seem to provide a common sense notion of right and wrongs? Well, here's the thing. If you are a rational animal, and you are a member of the human species and you've lived for any amount of time, well, you've been able to observe things, like for instance, earlier, our, our earlier example of chairs and whatnot, chairs, knives, uh, dogs, people, whatever. You've observed a, no a number of things, right? And you know, based on what the thing is, what they're supposed to do, right? There's something about um, seeing a, a, a society or, or a community work together and flourish and cooperate and so, and so on and so forth, as opposed to seeing a, uh, a society that's constantly uh, backbiting and breaking down one another and hurting one another. And then, of course, as, uh, what results? The society, the community crumbles. You, you, you've, 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 you've been able to see, you've been able to observe what those things are and you've been able to observe the right way that it's supposed to be as opposed to the wrong way. Well, what do we mean to say the right way? This is Aristotle again and Aquinas when they say that you've abstracted. You've abstracted. And what that means is that you've noticed something and you've pulled the nature or the ed essence of the thing from the thing itself, say the human or the dog or the knife or, or, or uh, computer or whatever, You've, put, you've, you've seen enough of these things over and over and over that you know what that's supposed to be, right? You've, you've abstracted the nature of, of the thing or the essence and exists now in your mind, and you see if things of that, uh, examples of those things, you see if they're fulfilling the nature or the essence of what they are. You've, you've, pulled, you've seen enough of these things that you've abstracted the nature and the essence of the thing, and you can now see if those things are living in accord with the nature or the essence of what they are, right? This is why no one had to tell you. Um, let me, well, first let me give you an example. And again, we're, going, we're using a, a man-made example, but that's okay. When one of my children were, were younger, we were driving down the road, you know, and, uh, you know, he would ask, what's this, daddy? What's this? What's this? What's this? You know? And I would say, oh, well, that's a truck. You know, he'd see a different one, different, completely different size, completely different color. What's that? Oh, well, that's a truck, too. All right. So this went on for some time. What's this? Oh, a truck, you know. Well, after a while, he noticed that though there was, it may be a completely different color. It may be a completely different size or shape. It may have the same wheels or not the same wheels. It may have this. It may have that. Well, one day we're riding down the road, right? And my son says, look, Dad, a truck. Now, had he ever seen that particular truck before? No. 
He had never seen that particular truck. Well, how did he know that that was a truck? He'd never seen that. He had never seen that particular truck that had the exact same specifications as, you know, whatever, it, whatever the specifications it had. He had never seen that one. Well, how did he know that was a truck? Well, your common sense right now, you're saying, well, because he's seen a lot of trucks. Right. But to fill in the gap there, yeah, you're right. He had seen a lot of trucks. But to fill in the gap, we want to explain something. And the explanation is he had abstracted what? The nature or the essence of a truck. Meaning he had seen enough trucks to realize, he was starting to realize what the nature of a truck. Remember, we're getting heavily philosophical here. He, he had seen enough trucks to realize, to abstract what a truck is, its isness, its nature, its essence. He now knows the nature of the essence of a truck. So now when he sees a particular vehicle, he can tell you if it's a truck or if it's not a truck, right? Because he knows the nature of a truck, the purpose of a truck, what it's for, what it does. And again, just the formal cause, the nature of the thing in question. Same thing with dogs, right? One of my daughters, you see this dog, you see this dog, you see this dog. And we know that at this point in time in our culture, it's hard to see two dogs that are exactly the same with the breeding and that goes on with these things. Over time, she says, look, daddy, a dog. Well, again, how did she know that was a dog? She'd never seen that one. How did she know that? How did she know that was a dog? Because she had seen enough of these particular animals that she had abstracted the nature or the essence dogness is what this is really, I mean, really what it's called. She had abstracted dogness so that now when she sees a particular example, she knows if it instantiates the nature of a dog, right? So she sees that another dog coming down the road. She knows it's a dog because she knows what a, the nature of the essence. She's abstracted that. It exists now within her mind. She has abstracted the nature of the essence of, the, of what it means to be a dog, right? And so, again, ask yourself, can you recognize a good dog from a bad dog? And again, we're not just talking about chewing up the couch or whatever. We're talking about a dog that lives in accord with the nature of essence. Or ask yourself, you know, you see a wolf, right? Is it a good wolf or a bad wolf? And again, we're not talking about uh, things such as whether it, you know, eats the cattle or whatever, eats your neighbor's cattle. We're talking about, uh, you know, is it living in accord with what wolves do, right? The end goal, the purpose of uh, wolves. Or is it running around in circles and slamming its head into the base of an oak tree all day long, right? No. It's not, if it's not doing that, if it's living in accord with its nature, its essence, then it is, right? A quote-unquote good wolf in the sense that it's a proper instantiation of that. Now, let's keep going for a minute. We've already slight. we've already touched on this here, but it's relatively neutral in regard to religious persuasions, natural law theory is. Why? Well, because you don't have to hold to some particular or one particular uh, religion to hold to natural law theory, meaning that you don't have to, strictly speaking, be a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim or a whoever, you know, an atheist or whatever. You don't, strictly speaking, you don't have to hold uh, to one of those uh, particular views to admit to the existence of natures and essences of things, right? You can say, well, I'm, you know, religion X or I'm not religion X or whatever, and I hold to uh, the belief that things do have a nature or an essence to them. There really are purposes um, that aren't arbitrary, uh, that aren't just made up by people uh, that do exist. So let's, let's touch on that part just very quickly about made up by people. Because knives do are made up right by people, right? Um, trucks and so on. You could make those, and you could make you could make those or not make those. You could you could do whatever in regard to those things. Um, doesn't mean that it's not a good knife or a good truck, but they didn't have to be. They didn't. They're not necessary things, right? So in one sense, they're arbitrary, meaning that we constructed them, right? However, there are other things, right, that exist apart from us, human construct, right? There are things that exist apart from us. So, uh, for instance, a triangle, uh, you know, you add, the, add up the, the 
the corners of the triangle and it's 180 degrees, whether any human exists or not. Now you may say, well, yeah, but if there's no human that exists, you can't add them up. Right, but that's not what we're claiming. We're just claiming that in principle, if they could be added up, if there was a triangle, it just would be the sort of thing that is a three-sided figure, you know, with, with 180 degrees uh, uh, once the corners are added together. Am I even getting that right? Is it, yes, the angles, but I'm, you know what I mean when I say that. So those are the sorts of things that just exist, whether people exist or whether they don't, right? Or an oak tree, right? If, if somehow all people went out of existence uh, or if oak trees existed before human beings, <clears throat> however that works, those things just are what they are, regardless of what of, of, of us and what we think about them, right? They just are what they are. Meaning this, the point is that they have their own nature or their essence, even though we didn't make them, or specifically because we didn't make them. They just already existed, right? Triangles um, are an example of this. And triangles are just triangles. Oak trees are just oak trees, regardless of what, uh, you know, whatever you know, someone's views on uh, the divine are, right? They just are those sorts of things. Now, before real quickly, there's going to be some uh, things here that in regard to religion, uh, some uh, theistic beliefs that will ground some of these other possible difficulties that atheism may not be able to ground but needless to say, you could, in theory, at least hold, still hold to something like natural law theory as an ethical theory and not necessarily be uh, uh, an adherent of one particular uh, faith system or whatever. So we'll just keep going. So the third appeal is, is, if this is true, if natural law theory is true, then people are just hardwired to use it without even knowing it, meaning this. Think about the convoluted aspect of deontology, right? It seems like that to know something was wrong, that you have to conscientiously know that you're creating some sort of contradict contradiction. Oh, well, if I promise, and or if I break my promise, rather, and if all people break their promise, then the very concept of promise is meaningless and it creates a contradiction, so therefore I shouldn't... Uh, and it's wrong to be here and unreasonable, and so since it's unreasonable, it's immoral, and therefore I shouldn't uh, create contradictions and break promises. Right now, is anybody doing that? Right now, again, I'm not asking if it's. I'm not saying claiming it's right or wrong at this point. Kant's deontology, but I'm just saying, do people even go about that sort of process when they're making decisions? Well. Most likely not, right? Now, again, that doesn't mean it's wrong, but it does have to, that, that is something that has, that ought to be and should be taken into account, right? No one's hardwired, or no one's, it seems like no one's hardwired to run this uh, logical formulation or syllogism um, in regards to rationality and morality and contradiction, right? That doesn't seem to be what's going on. Now, natural law theory, on the other hand, if this particular ethical theory is true, well, then you're already just doing all this, and you don't even necessarily have to be taught natural law theory. What do you mean you're already doing it? Again, when you look example after example after example after example or instantiation after instantiation after instantiation of some particular thing, well, then you're just something like hardwired to abstract the nature or the essence from the thing into your mind and you just intuitively do all of this, well not intuitively, but you do all of this based on your observation, meaning you're just quote unquote made to utilize this particular theory. You just, you can't not do it, right? Now you can go against it, right? I mean, this is an ethical theory. You can break uh, these rules, uh, which we'll look at in a moment, but Somewhere inside, you know what the thing in question is for after you've ob observed uh, enough of these things. Again, you've just been hardwired to pull, to abstract the nature of the essence out of the dog, out of the knife, out of the person, out of, the so out of society, out of whatever, to see the end goal, the purpose, 
which is tied up with its nature or essence, and you're just doing this already. Now, to be honest, I'm going to say that I really like that aspect of uh, natural law theory. I like the fact that it seems um, to be very appealing that people really are, in some shape, form, or fashion, abstracting the natures and essences of things, and therefore, therefore giving a, a very strong explanation as to why most people, all things being equal, know right from wrong. Um, know how a society ought to function. Know how uh, sexuality is supposed to go. Um, something like that. That does seem very just... Uh, um, <laughs> to use an analogy here, to use some natural, right? It seems, it seems very appealing. This, this gives not only possibly the, an explanation of ontology, uh, what grounds something is right or wrong, but epistemology, meaning it also gives, it has this extra credit sort of point in, sh in that people, we know not only is something right or wrong objectively, but we can see, we know how that it's right or wrong. We are, we're actually doing this process whether we know it or not. We're hardwired to do this process. Now the question might be, well, wait a minute, how is this subjective, right? How is this not merely arbitrary or relative? Like, how is this subjective? All right, let's go back to our triangle. Philosopher Ed Fader likes to give the example of, uh, of, uh, of a school child riding on the back of a school bus in some rural county area, and let's say it's on a dirt road and she's bumping across the, the road there. And he's trying to draw a triangle on the back of the school bus seat, right? He's in his little seat, the seat in front of him. He's trying to draw a triangle on the back of the back of the seat for whatever reason. Well, as he's drawing the triangle, right, and the bus is just bumping up and down, hitting rocks, you know, this line's kind of crooked, this line's kind of crooked. And he never actually makes, um, you know, what we would consider to be a really nice triangle. Now, when people see it and... Uh, you know, I've actually even drawn this on the board before. Um, kind of just imagine me drawing a, a squiggly line here and a, kind of a crooked line here, but you can still make out that it's a triangle. When people see that, people see this kid's thing there, they, they recognize that's a triangle, but they recognize it as a bad triangle. Why? They're like, oh, well, you know, I mean, that was obviously a triangle. I don't know what happened to that guy, but that's not a very good one. How do they recognize that as a bad triangle? Hopefully, you're already saying this because they've seen enough triangles, right? Bad ones, good ones, different color ones, small ones, large ones, whatever, that they've abstracted the nature or the essence of what it means to be a triangle, right? They know what the nature, the formal cause of a triangle is. Well, it's a three-sided uh, figure whose angles add up to 180 degrees. They know what a triangle is, and they're comparing... Here, listen to this. This is key. They're comparing that instantiation of a triangle to the nature or the essence of a triangle in their mind, right? They know what a triangle is supposed to be. They see that. They see that that, doesn't, that, that fails to live up to the exact nature or essence of a triangle. And so, therefore, they judge, right, that that's a bad triangle in light of what? Their opinion? No, in light of the nature or the essence of what a triangle is supposed to be. Let's say that again. When they see the triangle, they see that it's a bad, scrabbly, you know, scribbly uh, instantiation of a triangle. When they see that triangle, they judge that by the nature or the essence of what a triangle is supposed to be. They judge that as a bad triangle, as, not a, as a not good triangle. Do they? Is that their opinion? No. It's not your opinion whether or not this triangle is better than this triangle if this one is completely straight and its angles add up to 180 degrees. Why? Because that's just what a triangle is. This one, though it's supposed to be a triangle, and in one sense it is, doesn't fulfill, doesn't align, align with the nature or the essence of a triangle. That's nobody's opinion. 
You may like one better for whatever reason, but it still doesn't mean that that's a better triangle than this one if this one closer instantiates what it just means to be a triangle. Now, you see how that's subjective, right? That's not arbitrary. That's not made up, right? And the same thing with a squirrel. If a squirrel, Ed Fazer gives the example of a squirrel. Imagine one squirrel is eating, uh, you know, gathering you know, acorns and eating them and doing whatever squirrels do. And another squirrel, uh, you know, again, consistently falls off the limbs and he's laying in the middle of I-20, uh, you know, interstate here. And he's laying in the middle of that trying to eat uh, toothpaste, right? Is it anybody's opinion which is which animal is acting more in conjunction with the nature or essence of a squirrel and which animal is not um, fulfilling the nature or essence of a squirrel? Well, it's the one that consistently falls out of trees and can't function and thinks eating, you know, uh, crest toothpaste will benefit him, right? I mean, he, he dies. He can't, he's, he's, he's not fulfilling his nature, his end goal or purpose can't be met that way, and it kills him, right? Whose opinion is that? No one's opinion. Now, this is where this comes home, where the, the you know, where it comes home, uh, so to speak, where the rubber meets the road, is that, is this true of you and me? Do human beings have a nature or essence that can be abstracted, right? You observe humanity, observe a human, observe a human, observe a human. You observe the arm, a leg, a foot, a sexual organ or whatever, and you abstract the nature, the essence of the thing, you know what it's for, can human beings go against the nature or the essence of that thing? And what ends up happening to uh, the human in question um, when it goes against or breaks what it means to be a human or fails to live up to its nature or its essence? Um, I think this is... is relatively obvious um, that that can be the case. Let's keep moving on. Now, this is what I meant to say earlier that even though you don't have to strictly adhere to some particular brand of theism, it seems like that theism, if you combine this with theism, say something like you run it through something like divine command theory, that this can possibly resolve, remember our meta-ethical considerations, what makes something right or wrong? Of course, it should be reasonable, it should be rational, no less than that. But what ultimately grounds, what ultimately makes something right or wrong? And is the least arbitrary in that sense? It seems like this is where combining this particular theory with theism really starts to shine in the sense that it's not just arbitrary, right? It's not just uh, random natures or essences, but that these are made in accord with to reflect somehow the very nature, essence, mind, the rationality of God himself. Um, not sure how in-depth we can get with that, but this really does seem to go into the meta-ethical consideration, the grounding problem of, where, of what really makes something right or wrong, if you combine it with something like theism. Let's continue. Let's keep moving on for a moment. Now, make sure I didn't miss one. Okay. So one of the last appeals here is that this particular ethical theory, natural law theory, has a very long, very rich, very robust, a uh, very historic um, uh, lineage, so to speak, um, for objective morality. Again, this, this traces all the way back to even Aristotle, um, ancient Greek philosophy. Um, it runs through various religious traditions, um, most notably um, uh, the Catholic Church. Uh, the Catholic Church... Uh, has some, somewhat adopted um, natural law theory as something like it's loosely stated, official ethical type theory. Again, because of its rich intellectual and logical and, and rational uh, uh, contributions or roots there. 
and it doesn't contradict in some way uh, uh, Christian, Catholic, and or Christian uh, teaching. It seems to coincide nicely with that and even helps to provide uh, some sort of framework for many uh, theistic uh, commands and, and beliefs um, about human beings, about sexuality, about um, society, about all sorts of things like that, uh, or in that in that regard. Um, so yeah, it's it's long, it's old, it's it's there, and it's uh, been adopted by many uh, various theisms, specifically Christianity uh, and or officially Catholicism. Now, the first objection is swapping gears here, obviously, is that this whole idea of natures and essences, formal causes, final causes, um, that whole metaphysical system has to be true. What do we mean by that? What do I mean when I say that that whole metaphysical system has to be true? Well, what if there's no such thing as a formal or final cause? What if all that exists are uh, your first two causes, your efficient cause and your material cause? What if there's no such thing? What if those are just simply constructs of the human mind that don't really exist? There really is no real, true, objective purpose uh, to a thing. What if there really is no true and objective formal cause, no nature to a thing? Well, then the entire ethical theory would crumble, right? Because the ethical theory is banking on the fact that there really are natures and essences to things and that there really are purposes and end goals bound within the nature or essence of a thing. Now, that's a whole another philosophy class that we would have to get into to discuss that. It would be something like uh, nominalism versus uh, realism, right? Those are the two competing theories there, even maybe something like conceptualism. But by and large, nominalism, meaning that natures and essences are just in name only, they don't really exist, versus realism or moderate realism, which would claim no, natures and essences really do exist. Um, otherwise, you have no explanation at all as to why efficient and material causes perform the way they do. You, that is completely left. Um, unexplained unless something like natures and essences truly exist. And they would also say something like, uh, what does it even mean to say that there are no natures or there are no essences when we consistently, constantly appeal to the nature, the essence, and the purpose of a thing? They would say, it, you're saying it's just a name only, but nominalism is just a name only because if, if for no, at least practically speaking, you can't even function without there being a purpose, an end goal, to your very conversation even now, to your very uh, uh, ideas and thoughts as it were. Right? But again, that's a whole other argument to defend that particular point. But that would be something like a standard objection that natures and essences aren't really real and they're just human constructs. Just a little, let me go back to this. Just a little side note, free of charge here. Uh, I think they are actually real. So there you go. Now, two, a confused objection surrounds the meaning of natural. And again, remember, this is what we said earlier about what it means to be, what are we even talking about when we talk about the nature or the essence of a thing? Some might say, oh, well, it's natural for, you know, you know, think of that goofy song, you know, I was born this way. This is, you know, I can't even remember who sings it. I'm just very inept at pop culture. And you may be watching this, you know, lecture 30 years from now, and you don't even know what song I'm talking about, but apparently there's some song, I'm born this way, and so basically the, the argument is that that's what makes it, you know, fine or okay, whatever they're, whatever the behavior they're talking about, and that's what makes it fine because it was, they were born that way, and, and it's natural, you know, whatever. First, like we said, na natural law theory doesn't have anything to do with being born a certain way or something that happens in, the nat in nature like the law of the jungle. It's when natural, the word natural there is talking about nature or essence, nature slash essence, right? The essence of a thing, the nature of a thing. It's not talking about just whatever goes on in nature uh, in the wild, so to speak, nature in that sense. It's not talking about that, right? <clears throat> uh, 
Also, I think it's pretty obvious to see that just whatever happens in nature in the wild um, is not conducive, right? So again, like, you know, chimpanzees, you know, swing their feces all over the room. And <laughs> does that mean we're supposed to do that too? Because do we base our behavior off what animals do, right? Because animals do something or because uh, something happens in nature. Are we supposed to do that as well, right? I mean, uh, you know, a, a male lion, if he comes into a pride, uh, that was not previously his own. Sometimes one of the first things he does is destroy or kill uh, the cubs um, that were born by the prior uh, leader of the of the pride there, the prior uh, uh, male lion. He kills their cubs. So if that happens in nature, does that mean it's okay for stepfathers, once they marry a mother, to come in and just kill her children since they were born by the previous dad? Well, I, no. Right. So just because something happens in nature doesn't mean that it's OK. In fact, that's probably one of the stupidest things that I've ever heard. And you as well probably uh, have heard to try to justify uh, certain uh, actions or behaviors is that it happens in nature. Well, so, again, in philosophy, it's called a reductio ad absurdum. You can meaning it's a it's called it's an argument that reduces to the absurd. So you can just like we just did. You can take an example of something else that happens in nature. Uh, and show the absurd or contradictory consequence uh, to make that reasoning. Uh, well, it happens in the wild, it happens in nature, it must make it okay to show that that's just absolutely ridiculous. So that objection is just confused. That's not what natural law theory is talking about. Again, if I were to say right now, hey, what's natural law theory talking about? What happens in the wild? What happens in nature in that sense? You would say what? You would say no. Natural law theory, the word nature and natural law, is referring to, is making reference to natures or essen and essences of things, the formal cause, not what happens in the wild. Now, here's another question, another objection. What does one do with evolution, right? Does it disprove that fixed natures even exist, right? Because remember, you know, evolution is, is, uh, is, is claiming that, well, at least evolution, aside from some sort of theistic version of that, is saying that, well, nothing has a nature because everything just evolves and moves over time to be something to be what it was. And all. Well, long story short, remember, natural law theory is basically the moral theory, the ethical theory um, of the Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church also, also accepts as true uh, the theory of evolution. So, there seems to be no particular objection um, from evolution. Otherwise, they wouldn't have adopted both positions. Now, you could say, oh, well, they just don't know about it. Well, no, that's just not the case. In fact, um, in graduate school, I had to take an entire class on <clears throat> natural law theory and how it fits within something like the evolutionary model. Now, obviously, I'm not here to argue whether or not evolution is true or not. That's, you know, for your biologists or whoever else you want to speak with to go through. But I'm just trying to say that there is apparently no contradiction or there's no problem in saying that there that even though evolution, uh, if this is the way that things have come about, that natural law theory still fits in accord with that because there's still a template, there's still a form, there's still a formal cause. Um, in regard to that specific object in question. But again, if you want to go deeper in, into that, you can check the resources or even the text that we're reading even now for the course um, that may go into more depth than that. All right, now, another objection. And this is just, this comes straight from the six shooter of the physicalist, right? Or the materialist, or the materialistic naturalist, right? If all that exists is the physical, then there can be no immaterial nature or essence. Well, that's just true by definition, right? That's almost, <laughs> I mean, that's almost not even say, really making any sort of claim. I mean, that's just non-controversial. Well, right, if everything that, if, if all that exists is physical, if there's nothing um, that's, that, that exists that's not physical, well, then right, yeah, no nature or essence can exist at all. But that's entirely to beg the question, right? You can't object. You can't say, well, there's nothing physical exists, so nature as an essence can't exist. Well, that's just, you're just arguing in a circle, right? Well, how do you know that nature as an essence can't exist? Well, because the only thing that exists, exists is the physical. 
Well, basically what you've just said there is natures and essences can't exist because natures and essences aren't physical. And if something's not physical, it can't exist. You see how that's a circular argument? That's just arguing in a circle. It just completely begs the question. Um, again, because everyone could see, well, yeah, if, if the only thing that exists is that which you can touch, right? Taste, see, or see, or feel, or smell, or whatever. Well, then, yeah, nothing non-material can exist. Duh, right? But the thing is, this is a reason, natural law theory, natures and essences are a reason to think that physicalism is false, right? If there really are natures or essences to things, and they really do exist, and they really are abstracted from the thing in question, now exist in the mind, then there's something that exists that's just not physical. So really, instead of this being an objection to natural law theory, natural law theory would be something like an argument against physicalism, right? So you would have to have an argument not only against or not only just for physicalism, but you would also have, an, have to have an argument as to why natures and essences couldn't possibly exist because it is only, it's only on that account that if you show that natural law theory or that natures and essences don't exist, um, that you could continue to say that physicalism um, is true, right? That, the only, that all that exists is matter, right? So this would just be almost something like a circular, circular argument, not a good objection at all. Um, now, again, we've asked, our, asked ourselves this question every uh, time that we have uh, discussed an ethical theory. Does this particular theory account for moral guilt? Uh, oh, I didn't live up to my nature or my essence today, right? Or, oh, I, did, I performed this action. This completely perverts or stultifies um, you know, the point or the purpose of, of my, this organ or this whatever uh, and I feel terrible about it well maybe I'm not sure that that really can account robustly for moral guilt again this might be one of the reasons again why you might have to run this through this particular ethical through something like uh, theism something like that to try and account for uh, a robust sense of moral guilt meaning that you're guilty because or you feel guilty because you are guilty right um, some, of the, some of the ethical theories that we've talked about before, um, you feel guilty, but it may not be really because you're guilty in the morally relevant sense, but because you were just irrational or because you um, mis, misweighed the consequences in regards to flourishing for something or whatever. Um, so th again, this has to be a question that's answered um, in regard to every ethical theory. At least in my view, it's a question that should be entertained and, and answered um, does this account for moral guilt? Um, because moral guilt is just, I don't know how you separate that from the equation. I mean, part of what it means to be a human is that we feel guilt when we, when we think that we've done something wrong. And even if we don't feel guilt, we have a knowledge of, of, of guilt in some sense. Even, say, something like sociopaths, it is argued that don't feel guilty. Well, that's different than knowing right from wrong. Um, than feeling right from wrong. Those are distinct categories that are often confused in our society, right? In fact, some would say, oh, well, they don't feel guilty, so it can't be wrong. Well, how does that compute, right? Just because you don't feel a certain way doesn't mean that you don't know a certain thing to be true. So anyway, let's keep going. Now, these are some, these are some of our conclusions, some of our takeaways. Um, again, this isn't dead as an ethical theory. In fact, I didn't mention this earlier. I should have, but remember the Constitution is bound up within this whole concept of natural law theory. In fact, there are many that would try to argue, um, you know, natural law theory is outdated, it's antiquated, and, and it's an antique, I <laughs> have to do the porky pig thing there, um, that natural law theory is dead, um, there's no such thing as natures or essences, not realizing that the entire constitution of the United States is bound up within um, natural law theory. I mean, this was how the framers of the Constitution tried to ground um, certain inalienable rights, right, as the, as the lingo goes, um, endowed by their creator, right, and you know this by natural law, is what they would say. So it's kind of playing with fire there when you have those that are arguing 
against that, not realizing that our whole constitution is bound up within that theory. Now, it does currently have strong defenders, uh, people like uh, Robert George out of uh, Princeton. Um, I believe it's Princeton, maybe it's Yale. Maybe it's Harvard. Either way, <laughs> Robert George is, is a defender. Now he's a defender of what would be called the new natural law theory. Um, Ed Fazer, um, current popular philosopher out of California is a big advocate for natural law theory. Uh, you've got all sorts of guys. Um, Tim Asaw has made some big contributions um, called the perverted faculty argument in regard to natural law theory. Um, you've got all, it, it's not dead, it's still there. Um, it seems to be the most plausible for non-physicalists and theists. So again, our conclusion, one of our conclusions, one of our takeaways is that if you are staunchly committed to physicalism um, or materialism, that all that exists is matter, then this may be a more difficult ethical theory, right? However, most people are not staunchly physicalists or materialists, and this seems to be more plausible for those types of people. I happen to be one of those. I happen to be, you know, a person that doesn't find physicalism um, or materialism to be plausible, um, though possible, but I don't find it to be plausible, and so natural law theory still seems to hold some weight in my view. Um, I'm not sure if we want to go into this bonus. I'm going to go ahead and toss it out. Is that what is the result of the loss of nature's essences? Um, you can pause this and think about this for a moment yourself. Like, what would be the result if there really are no natures or essences to things? Um, one of the consequences to that might be what? Um, just one, just to go ahead and toss out for example, is if there is no nature or essence to a thing, then you can make a thing whatever you want it to be, right? Now, the problem with that is, the first, the appeal to that might be might be to say, oh, well, oh, fantastic, yeah. If there's no nature or essence to a thing, there's no standard that exists apart from my opinion that I have to adhere to. I can just make myself be whatever I want to be, right? Or I can make whatever in question be whatever I want it to be. Now, again, the problem with that is, that's just not possible, right? I mean, you can climb to the Eiffel Tower and you can say, I'm a bird, um, even though you don't have the nature or essence of a bird, even though you've convinced yourself that there are so, no such thing as natures or essences, and you don't instantiate a bird at all and you jump off the Eiffel Tower, well, reality doesn't seem to care about your opinion or your construct or what you wanted to be. Now, you may say, ah, but I'll make wings as like, like I'm a bird. Well, well, right, but that's not the same thing. Um, in fact, the wings have to be, have to have their own nature or essence to be the sort of thing they are in question in order for them to work, right? Again, you can't say, oh, well, they can be, I can make whatever I want to be, what it be, want to be, and then take two broomsticks and try to fly with those, right? No, you'd have to find something that has the nature of essence of flying as its purpose, right, or its end goal. So you just really can't get around a lot of this stuff, right, in regard to nature or essences, but that's a whole different class, whole different discussion, whole different argument. But just something interesting to think about as you try to uh, go through what would it be like uh, if things, if we did lose the nature or the essence of things. Um, with that said, for more, you can go, here's some excellent material for, from one of the guys I just mentioned uh, previously, Ed Fazer on natural law theory. Um, and then also, uh, again, check with our resources that you're reading right now for the class, for the course. Um, with that said, with that said, we conclude our discussion on natural law theory, and we'll move into our next theory next time. All right, all right, all right.